Welcome to Learning English on the Voice of America. I'm Katie Weaver. Our program is designed for people learning English. We speak slowly, using simple grammar and a limited vocabulary. Today on the show, we have an education report from Dan Friedel. We also hear from Dan Novak, Brian Lynn, and John Russell. We close our show with words and their stories from Ana Mateo. Now, let's go to Dan Novak. A recent study says illegal loggers have destroyed about 18,500 square kilometers of public forests over the past six years in the Brazilian Amazon rainforest. But, the study says, the nation's federal police do not investigate the loss enough. The wood cutting took place in state and federal forests that are unallocated. That means they are neither part of a national park nor are they considered native territories. Official data says the Brazilian Amazon has about 580,000 square kilometers of unallocated forest. That is an area almost the size of Ukraine. The public forests have become a target for criminals who illegally seize land. Igarapé Institute, a Brazilian policy research group, released the study. The group researched 369 environmental crime operations carried out by the federal police in the Amazon between 2016 and 2021. Only 2% targeted people illegally seizing unallocated public lands. It also found that the federal police created only seven operations to investigate this large loss. The federal police did not answer the Associated Press's request for comment about its work in the Amazon. The report said the lack of enforcement likely comes from the weak legal protection of these areas. Environmentalists have long pressed the federal government to turn unallocated public forests into protected areas. Brazil returned to democratic rule in 1985 after 20 years of military rule. Most of the democratic governments have expanded protected forests. Today, about 47% of the Amazon is protected land, official data says. But President Jair Bolsonaro has said the country has too many protected areas and has slowed adding new protected land. In 2016, about 2,240 square kilometers of unallocated public land were illegally harvested for wood. Last year, that area reportedly almost doubled. Over six years, the total amount of land with illegal harvesting activity reached 18,500 square kilometers. That information comes from the Amazon Environmental Research Institute, which is linked to the World Bank. Deforestation is increasingly taking place on unallocated lands. In 2016, unallocated land made up 31% of all illegally cut forest. Last year, the amount reached 36%. The Brazilian nonprofit group Climate Observatory said that almost half of Brazil's climate pollution comes from deforestation. The group said there is so much destruction that the eastern Amazon has, on average, stopped absorbing carbon gases from the Earth's atmosphere. Instead, a study published in 2021 in the journal Nature suggests it is now turning into a source of carbon gases. Carbon gases are blamed for trapping heat in the Earth's atmosphere. Igarapé divides environmental crime in the Amazon into four major illegal activities. Stealing of public land, illegal logging, 
illegal mining, and deforestation connected to agriculture and cattle raising. The enforcement operations were spread over 846 places. Nearly half were in protected areas, like the Yanomani Indigenous Territory. The area has a heavier police presence, but has still been invaded by thousands of illegal gold miners. The Igarape study also pointed to a large ecosystem of crime, as the police operations took place in 24 of Brazil's 27 states, including eight cities in neighboring countries. Environmental crime stems from illicit economies that access consumer markets and financing outside the Amazon, the report said. I'm Dan Novak. Security experts say a popular Chinese-made automobile tracking device presents a serious risk of cyber attacks. A cyber attack is an attack on or through a computer network. The device, manufactured by Shenzhen-based Mikodas, is used by people worldwide to protect their vehicles from being stolen. A report by the U.S.-based cybersecurity company BitSight has warned that the system has severe software vulnerabilities. The issues could permit attackers to remotely hijack vehicles using the tracking device, security researchers said. This could give attackers the ability to cut off fuel or seize control of the vehicle while it is moving, BitSight said in its report. The MV720 device costs less than $25, BitSight says. The researchers recently issued a press release that urges any users of the device to stop using it until a fix for the vulnerabilities becomes available. BitSight's report came as a U.S. government agency issued an official advisory that also described the device's vulnerabilities. BitSight told the Associated Press it had tried since September to communicate with representatives of Mikodas to discuss the security risks it had identified. It said those attempts were not successful, BitSight said the U.S. agency investigating the device, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, or CISA, joined its efforts to communicate with Mikodas in April. The Associated Press emailed Mikodas about the matter, but reported it did not receive an answer. CISA said in a statement that it did not know about any active exploitation of the vulnerabilities. GPS trackers are used worldwide to follow vehicle groupings from trucks to school buses to military vehicles. The devices also act as security to prevent vehicles from getting lost or stolen. In addition to collecting data on vehicle tracking, many devices are also equipped to examine other information about vehicle and driver actions. This information could include driver behavior and fuel usage. Many of the devices are able to control a vehicle's fuel or locking systems, and more. Using the MV720 device, BitSight said, a cyber attacker could remotely cut off the fuel line of a vehicle in motion. An attacker might also be able to see where a vehicle is in real time for spying purposes, 
said BitSight researcher Pedro Umbalino. One of the device's main vulnerabilities is that it comes with a default password that more than 90% of users do not change, BitSight found. It also discovered security weaknesses in software the web server uses to control the devices over the Internet. Mikodas claims that about 1.5 million of the devices are being used by 420,000 customers. BitSight said its research found that among the customers were a major energy company and an aerospace company and national militaries in South America and Eastern Europe. Others included a nuclear power plant operator and a national law enforcement agency in Western Europe. BitSight did not name any of the companies. Countries with the most users included Brazil, Mexico, Spain, and Russia. Richard Clark is a former top U.S. cybersecurity official. He told the AP that while he does not believe the device was designed to be used maliciously by the Chinese government, that remains a possibility. Clark said the threat is real because Chinese companies are required by law to follow their government's orders. You just wonder how often are we going to find these things that are infrastructure where there's a potential for Chinese abuse and the users don't know, Clark said. I'm Brian Lin. Researchers recently offered the most complete examination yet of the history of penguins. Penguins are short-legged flightless seabirds that mainly live in the southern half of the world. The researchers studied the genomes of the twenty living penguin species and subspecies. With more than three-quarters of known penguin species no longer existing, the researchers also included in their study fifty fossil species using skeletal data. The researchers said penguins came from a common ancestor shared with a group of seabirds that includes albatrosses and petrels. Penguins first developed the ability to dive, like a puffin, and then lost the ability to fly as they adapted to water. The earliest known penguin is called Waimanu Manaringai from New Zealand. It is believed to have lived 61 million years ago. Daniel Ksepka of the Bruce Museum in Greenwich, Connecticut, is the co-writer of the study that was published in Nature Communications. We know penguins evolved from flying birds, but that happened over 60 million years ago, and we need to look to the fossil record to piece together where, when, and how that happened, he said. Ksepka noted that penguins are appealing animals. He added that they are ridiculously charming creatures. They love, they fight, they steal, and because of their funny upright posture, it's really easy to imagine them having all the same motivations as people. Motivation is a term that means a cause or reason for doing something. The study proposes that changes in world temperatures and in major ocean currents have been important drivers of penguin evolution. Penguins live mainly in the southern hemisphere. The Galapagos penguin is the only one found north of the equator. The University of Copenhagen's Teresa Cole was the study's lead writer. Cole said the research found a number of genes likely involved in physical changes known as adaptations. 
Such adaptations include gene mutations that shift the way penguins see the world. Penguins' vision is more sensitive toward the blue end of the color spectrum. Blue light goes more deeply into the ocean than light at the red end of the spectrum. Genes that help birds detect salty and sour tastes are active in penguins, but genes that helped detect bitter, sweet, and savory tastes are inactivated. Those may no longer be needed as penguins find food in cold, salty water and usually swallow prey, including fish, shrimp, and squid, whole. Penguins show changes in their wing bones and a reduction of their flight feathers. Penguins also have reduced air spaces in the skeleton and the ability to store more oxygen in their muscles for long dives. Penguins were once much larger than today's species. One ancient species, Kumimanu baisei, lived in New Zealand between 55 and 60 million years ago and stood about 1.8 meters tall. The largest modern species, the emperor penguin, is about one meter tall. I'm John Russell. Diana Bicesar of Paraguay is heading into her third year at Pitzer College in Claremont, California. Early in the pandemic, Bicesar could not come to the United States. She spent her first year of college learning by video from the South American country. During that time, Bicesar said she talked with over 100 international students studying in the U.S. She found out that many experienced difficulties while looking for internships or work. Besides visa restrictions, they said there was a lack of professional development resources at the schools. Some did not know about the Optional Practical Training Program, or OPT. It is a U.S. government program that permits international students to stay in the U.S. for one more year after graduation and work in their field of study. I have met with many students who didn't know about OPT or who didn't know how to write an American-style resume, who didn't know who to reach out to for help. And they have to go back to their countries because, you know, they didn't have enough time to, to work on their applications, to do their research because it was too late. That is when Bicesar started working on a website designed to help international students with internships and job hunting in the U.S. After almost two years, MAPIS was launched last February. The site is currently open to a small number of users. Bicesar said she hopes to make it available to all international students later this year, and she is building the website while working on an internship program at the technology company Meta. One professional who knows what it is like to be an international student is Eun Kyu Lee, who came from South Korea in the 1980s. He is now a professor and a leader of Syracuse University's business school. Lee said, many international students know that it will be harder for them to find jobs than American students if they want to stay in the U.S. As a result, they start learning about visa and work programs early on. He said it is a good idea to join a networking group centered on international students, such as MAPIS, along with a more general service, such as LinkedIn. Uh, if you don't have that kind of network or mentoring, then the only resource you may have is just official job posting, which receives hundreds of resumes. And there, it may be really difficult for international students to stand out. Bisesar agreed that it is important for international students to hear from successful people who were once new to the U.S. 
It helps them feel more confident about their own abilities. In 2022, MAPIS organized several online gatherings to connect students with those working in business, journalism, and technology. Bisesar told VOA that learning English changed her life. She said she would not be where she is today without a scholarship from the English Access Micro Scholarship Program in Paraguay. I always say, you know, like I was born again when I was 15, when I got this scholarship. My whole life changed after that. Coming to the U.S. for college also opened other doors for me, like this amazing internship that I have right now, and also creating MAPIS. So, yeah, I, I always motivate people to, to study English. Bucesar also attended the Education USA Academy at Temple University in Philadelphia one summer, where she lived and learned with Americans and other international students. Beyond STEM, or subjects in science, technology, engineering, and math, Bucesar wants MAPIS to be a place where international students can learn about business, social programs, and government. In fact, Lee, the Syracuse professor, said community service projects are a great way for international students to expand their networks and learn to work with Americans. You know, you may not be directly related with their uh, major or directly related with the internship or career opportunities that they are pursuing, but kind of experiencing themselves that they can add value to the community around in the U.S. society, uh, I think it's a, a very important part uh, to develop their own self-identity and confidence. Bisesar agreed. After they go back to their countries, they usually make a big impact, she said. I'm Dan Friedel. And now, words and their stories. From VOA Learning English. We walk through doors many, many times a day. If we want to enter any building, we must go through a door. And that building could be a new home, an interesting store or restaurant. Maybe it is a school, library, or laboratory. We don't know for sure what is on the other side of a door. If you think about it, doors offer us many possibilities and opportunities. That may be why we have several expressions that connect doors with opportunity. First, let's talk about an opportunity. An opportunity is a chance for greater success. It is a good chance for advancement or progress. Or it can be just a chance for something different. But you won't know unless you open the door. So when opportunity comes knocking, be ready to answer the door. This expression means you do not want to miss an opportunity. There is a certain sadness and regret involved in a missed opportunity. You don't always get a second chance. That is why we also say, opportunity knocks but once. You may also hear it said this way, opportunity seldom knocks twice. Both expressions mean that great opportunities are usually only offered to us one time. We use these expressions to urge people to act quickly and to take an opportunity when it comes to them. Now, sometimes an opportunity is not a completely open door. Maybe the door is open just a little, a crack. If that happens and you want to get in, you should make sure to put your foot in the door. Imagine you are standing in a doorway, and you want to get inside the building. You want to be part of whatever is happening in there. With your foot in the door, you are one step closer to making that happen. 
when you have a foot in the door, you have an opportunity to get inside a building. The same can be said for a situation. Sometimes all you need to succeed is a small chance or opportunity to prove yourself. This is especially true for people who do not have connections that can open doors for them. Getting your foot in the door is a way to open that door of opportunity for yourself. Here is an example. I had a short-term job in New York City in the publishing industry. The job did not pay very much, but it was a good way for me to get my foot in the door. Now, sometimes in life, things do not go our way. The door of opportunity. Slams in our face, but that's okay. We have another expression that can fix that problem. When one door closes, another one opens. This expression means that the end of one situation or opportunity may be followed by the start of a new one. You can use this expression to offer hope to someone who may have lost a good opportunity. And that's all the time we have for this words and their stories. Until next time, I'm Ana Mateo. Do you have questions about American English, or do you have thoughts you'd like to share about our program? We want to hear from you. You can comment on our website at learningenglish.voanews, or write to us. Send your email to learningenglish at voanews dot com. And that's our show. But we'll be back tomorrow, same time, same place, with another learning English program on the Voice of America. Thanks for joining us. I'm Katie Weaver.